Hi all, it's Dr. Smexer again. This week we're going to be talking about sexual differentiation. It's a continuation of our conversation into understanding why sexual behavior exists. We've already spent a few weeks talking about sexual reproductive behavior in the context of Tim Bergen's four reasons why, or Tim Bergen's four questions. So we talked about why sexual reproduction is adaptive, the fitness value of sexual reproduction, specifically talking about how it leads to genetic variation in offspring, which offers a survival advantage for the individuals and for the species. We've talked about it from a phylogenetic evolutionary standpoint, understanding that sexual reproduction evolved long before animals evolved within our eukaryotic ancestors, very similar to current day protists. And for the last week, we've been focused on the more proximate mechanisms for sexual reproduction, specifically looking at the developmental or ontogenetic reasons why animals are sexual within their reproduction. And we're going to continue on with our conversations to understand a bit more about how the two sexes developed. So we spoke last week about why the two sexes exist, and this is due to the uh, advantage of anisogamy. So anisogamy is to remind you when we have different sexes within a species based on their gamete size. So we know that females have large gametes and we know that males have small gametes. And last week we discussed that each of these, the large gamete and the small gamete, have their advantages, but medium-sized gametes tend not to do so well. And that's why we see these two separate sexes within species. We talked about how in sexually reproducing species, there is a variety of ways in which sex can be determined. So each species wants some number of males and females with each generation so that you have you know, approximately half of your population producing the small gametes and half of your population producing the large gametes. And so throughout evolutionary history, we've seen the development of a number of different mechanisms, both genetic and environmental, that leads to the differentiation of females with, and males within each species. Um, and so if you don't recall, review that um, recording from last week, but we talked about a variety of different genetic and environmental ways in which species determine their sex. We finished up last week's lecture with the statement that sex determination is really just the mechanism that starts a developing offspring on their path to becoming either male or female. So determination is going to be the mechanism that determines which sex that offspring becomes. And what we're focused on today is differentiation, which is how that offspring is going to, going to develop into either a male who produces sperm, those small gametes, or a female who produces eggs, those large gametes. So that's really our focus today. Now again, to remind you, we've used this term already. When the sperm and egg come together, they form a single cell that is diploid that is called a zygote. So the sperm have half as many chromosomes as a diploid cell. An egg has half as many chromosomes as a diploid cell. And when the sperm and egg come together, we often call this fertilization, the sperm fertilizes the egg, the two sets of chromosomes will combine together to make a complete full set, diploid set of chromosomes for that zygote. That first cell is called the zygote. Now, 
after fertilization occurs, there's a whole series of steps, but basically what happens is that zygote starts to go through the process of mitosis. So repeating the cell cycle over and 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 over again, creating, producing new cells from that original cell. And this, this pathway is really fascinating, though we won't focus on it today. Hopefully you'll get the opportunity to take a developmental biology course in the future. Um, but this fascinating journey from zygote to fully developed offspring um, includes many, 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 many steps, all controlled by genetics. But what we're really going to focus on is what happens um, specifically looking at determining if that zygote is going to develop into an embryo that develops into either a male or a female fetus. So the embryo stage is where cells start to differentiate. So essentially, if you think about stem cells that are omnipotent, that have the ability to become any sort of cell in the future, that starts very early on within embryonic development and the cells start becoming different types of cells including those cells that are going to eventually be involved in the production of the gametes and the production of those characteristics that make an organism male or female but very early on the differentiation is exactly the same whether you're a male or a female, very early on in development, we see essentially fetuses that would be the same if it's going to be a male or a female. And so this process that we're focused on, sex differentiation, is going to involve a whole series of events where this non-sexed uh, fetus develops either into a male or female. So early on, the urogenital system, which we see the internal ur urogenital system here, we've got some kidneys, um, a bladder, the urethra, and then we also have the sexual organs that are associated with the urogenital system. Um, and at this point, they're indifferent. They are not male or female. They have not yet differentiated. So we see uh, gonads, which are eventually going to become either um, the testes or the ovaries. And then we also have the internal reproductive tracts, which can either develop into the female reproductive tracts or the male reproductive tracts. But early on, within the developmental stages, for humans and for other animals, we see that essentially both systems, or neither, I suppose, develop early on. And so how do we go from this stage where the fetus does not have a set sex yet to the stage where the fetus is clearly male or female. So that's what we're going through today. We're going to look at the different influences that lead to this differentiation. It often starts with sex chromosomes, although as we talked about last time, sex determination doesn't have to start with sex chromosomes. I'm going to focus today on those systems that do develop due to sex chromosomes, like ours, because of course human sexual differentiation has been well studied and is of serious interest to us, and so we understand the mammalian system probably the best, um, followed by perhaps the avian systems. So this lecture is focused more on mammals, though the same um, mechanisms, as we will see, or I should say similar mechanisms, as we'll see, are in play if we're talking about organisms that determine sex in other ways, such as temperature-dependent sex determination or socially-dependent sex determination. 
the internal mechanisms are actually very similar um, and will even include some genetics associated with that. So really genetics is at the core of determining these biological characteristics of males and females. Those genetics will have an influence on the gonads and determine if those develop into testes or ovaries. We will then see that those endocrine tissues, the testes and the ovaries, start to excrete hormones and then hormones are what lead to the development of the internal reproductive ducts and the external genitalia. Hormones and genitalia and experience likely have some influence on gender identity, though we know that that is not necessarily always going to be uh, congruent with the sex chromosomes that a human or any in any animal really um, starts with. So we're really focusing not on the gender aspect of it, but on the biological aspect of it. Um, and hopefully you read through this week's or last week's posted reading. If you haven't yet, give it a look. Um, Midgen and Wisniewski go through um, many of the mechanisms that I'm talking about today, talking about the genetics, the differentiation of the, the gonads, the production of the different hormones, and how that leads to the external and internal development for males and females. So, like I said, we can start by focusing on genes, because this is really what is going to start this process of differentiation. I will focus on mammals and humans, specifically here we're looking at some human sex chromosomes. Um, most of the mammals would also follow along on the same um, path of differentiation. In other organisms like birds, it'd be a very similar pathway, although remember we learned last time, birds have different sex chromosomes. Um, they don't have XX and XY, instead they have ZW and ZZ. But again, the same basic ideas. I'll just focus specifically on mammals and humans so that we can kind of get an understanding of it. So again, focusing on the XXXY sex determining system, differentiation really has everything to do with the Y chromosome and the SRY gene. So if we look at this, um, I suppose you could call this sort of an abbreviated karyotype, this photograph of some duplicated chromosomes. We've got a duplicated X chromosome here. You know, chromosomes are made up of DNA and chromatin, so you can see they're condensed here. Um, this is our X chromosome, and this is a Y chromosome. You can see they're different. They're very different. Normally, if we look at two homologous chromosomes, like two number sevens or two number thirteens of your homologous um, chromosomes, we would see that they looked very similar. They'd be the same length, they'd have the same genes on them, but the XY sex chromosomes are, are, one, are the one exception to that. The Y chromosome has very different genes than the X chromosome does, so they're, they're technically not homologous chromosomes. They act like it through meiosis, um, and so we, early on when we're learning about sort of cell cycle and understanding meiosis, we, we talk about them as though they were homologous chromosomes, but technically they're not because they're not exactly the same, right? Y chromosomes, I mean, just looking at it, much smaller, many fewer genes. X chromosome has a couple thousand genes on it, um, so clear differences between the two chromosomes and the information that's going to be found on those chromosomes. Here I put up for you sort of a, a genetic map of, I mean abbreviated genetic map, of the human X and Y chromosome. And um, we also can compare that to other mammals. So by chance we're looking here at a ring-tailed lemur and a dog who also have the X 
XXY sex determining system like other mammals do. Um, and so looking at the X chromosome, which is much, much longer, if we sort of map out the genes that are on this chromosome, none of them have to do with sex determination. They have many other functions. Um, we always think about them in terms of like color blindness, right? Because in genetics, we learn about, you know, um, red green color blindness is controlled by a few genes on the X chromosome. And so males and females inherit X, um, X linked color blindness differently. So yes, that's one great example of genes that are on an X chromosome that have absolutely nothing to do with sex determination. And there's thousands of other genes on the X chromosome just like that. They're important. They do important things for males and females, but they're not involved in sex determination. And that's true for humans and other mammals. The gene that we've discovered that is involved in sex determination is the SRY gene, and it's shown in red on each of these figures. The SRY gene stands for Sex Determining Region of the Y, and there's an equivalent to this, not the same gene, but in many of those other species that have sex chromosomes. So those other organisms in fish, in birds, in certain reptiles, they have similar though different genes. But in all mammals, we find this sex determining region of the Y, the SRY gene. Uh, and not much else, not much else on this little Y chromosome. Uh, the SRY gene is definitely the most important of the hundred or so genes that are found on that Y chromosome. So it's one little gene, but it's really important. So let's talk about why it's really important. So here we have sort of an abbreviated um, pathway of what normal sex development would look like for humans or other mammals. So early on in development, Again, there has not yet been sex differentiation, but the urogenital tracts and the system has developed. So we have these those indifferent gonads. These are just essentially a lot of cells that are able to become many different types of cells. So these are germ cells that haven't differentiated yet. So there are cells that could become the cells that could make sperm, or there are cells that could become the sperms that could make eggs. So they're undifferentiated at this point, right? We would, on some level, consider them to be stem cells because they have not yet completely definitively become the type of cell that they are going to be. And it's only at about seven to eight weeks for humans that the SRY gene is going to be activated and is going to start to differentiate these cells. So let's look first at the males because the males up here on top, conveniently shown in blue for us, um, they are the ones who have the SRY gene. So remember, they have the Y chromosome and they have an SRY gene. Females do not have an SRY gene because they don't have a Y chromosome. So the SRY gene gets activated in these cells, right, that are part of those gonads, like I said, around seven or eight weeks gestation time for humans. In other species, it'd be equivalent based on how long their gestation is. If it's a short gestation, it might happen within a couple of days. If it's a long gestation, it might happen many weeks later. So depending on the organism we're talking about, it's going to vary, but it's relatively early on in gestation. So relatively early on in development. So the SRY gene gets turned on. And think back to what we know about genetics and what I mean when I say it gets turned on. So not all of our genes are being expressed all the time, right? We have lots, we have thousands of genes, 30,000 genes about, 
And there are different um, transcription factors and promoters that turn genes on and off. And so up to this point, the SRY gene for males has not yet been activated. It hasn't been turned on yet. It's essentially been off. The DNA is there, but it hasn't done anything. But at this point, there are transcription factors that will turn the SRY gene on if there is an SRY gene. So if you're a male and you have an SRY gene, these transcription factors will turn on the SRY gene. And what that means, again, to think about what we know about genetics, now that a gene has been turned on, it's going to go through that process of making mRNA and then making a protein, right? Thinking about central dogma, we have our DNA, transcription factors turn it on, starting transcription. Now we have some mRNA. That mRNA is going to go through that whole process of translation, and it's going to make a protein product. If you remember, the end of translation, the end of a gene being turned on, is the formation, the, the making of some chain of amino acids that does something, right? So what is this something? This something is called TDF. We call it TDF. It stands for testes determining factor. We're really boring. We're, we're really boring in biology. Some people even just call this the SRY gene product. Um, you may see in the paper that we read, sometimes they refer to this as like the SOX9 gene product because of the relationship between these different gene names. Sometimes when we talk about development in endocrine studies, um, there have been different terms used because of how we study this in different organisms. But basically, you need to know that the product of the SRY gene, the SRY product, the SRY protein, is a protein that we call testes determining factor. So it's essentially an enzyme. So this enzyme is going to then turn that indifferent, that undifferentiated gonad into the testes. So that gonad is basically a group of cells that hasn't yet turned into anything specific in terms of a body part gets turned into testes. And what I, what I mean by that is the cells that are already there. So they're already part of that, that indifferent, undifferentiated gonad. They start becoming different cell types, right? Like how we have, you know, neurons and epithelial skin cells and blood cells. At one point, all those cells look the same, and then they start on a path of differentiation, and then they become a bone cell or a blood cell or a neuron. The same is true for the cells within the gonads. In the testes, the cells become either Sertoli cells or Leydig cells. So the testes determining factor is a protein that takes these cells that haven't committed to a cell type yet, and it commits them to either becoming these Sertoli cells or these Leydig cells, which is what you see like in a, an adult testes. You would see these two different cell types, Sertoli cells and Leydig cells. So two different cell types make up the majority of the cells that are found within the testes. All right, how are we doing so far? Following along? Jot down some notes if you have questions. So again, in these males, the SRY gene gets activated. That causes the production of testes determining factor. That leads to the production of Sertoli and Leydig cells. So now we have a testes full of these different types of cells. What do these cells do? Well, these cells have sort of two different functions. They're both um, endocrine tissue which means they're able to make hormones, right? Endocrine cells make hormones, 
which are usually either proteins or lipids, but they have all the mechanisms necessary to make hormones. Sertoli cells make a hormone, hormone uh, protein hormone called MIF, Eulerian Inhibiting Factor. Sometimes this is called MIS, so you may have seen that in your reading. This would be called Mullerian Inhibiting Substance. They're the same thing. We just have used different terms throughout the years. But MIF or MIS, um, again, does exactly what the name says, which inhibits the Mullerian system. And the Mullerian system is essentially the internal female reproductive tract. So the tract that turns into your fallopian tubes, the uterus, the upper part of the vagina, the cervix, that's the Mullerian system. Those undifferentiated fetuses that haven't yet committed to a path develop the Mullerian tract and the Wolfian tract. Both tracts, the female tract and the male tract. And it's now that the female tract goes away, right? So the Mullerian inhibiting factor essentially causes it to regress. It's technically still there, but it's teeny tiny. It's teeny, it's teeny tiny in there, but it, it goes away. It does not develop. The male reproductive tract, on the other hand, is going to develop into the structures that are part of the male reproductive tract. But that is not the job of the Sertoli cells. The Sertoli cells, they're secreting the MIF, and that leads to the regression of the Mullerian tract, right? Because it causes MIF to basically shut it down. The Leydig cells, it's their job to produce testosterone, which you've heard of before, right? Testosterone is the main androgen, which is a um, steroid hormone that males secrete. And it's secreted by the Leydig cells within their testes. It's the Leydig cells secreting the testosterone that leads to the production or the um, development of the internal male genitalia. So the internal Wolfian ducts become part of the you know, vas deferens and the seminiferous tubules. So the male internal genitalia develop because of testosterone. At the same time, some of the testosterone that the Leydig cells are secreting, so they're, they're making the testosterone and they're secreting it, some of that testosterone reacts with an enzyme called 5-alpha reductase. So this is an enzyme that switches the structure of testosterone a little bit. So testosterone actually has like a whole bunch of related hormones that are all sort of part of this androgen group, including DHT, which is dihydrotestosterone. So it's, it's like testosterone, but it's got a slightly different structure um, based on the, the enzyme or because of the enzyme 5-alpha reductase. So it turns testosterone into a slightly different androgen. It's the DHT that actually leads to the production of the external male genitalia. So yes, Technically, I guess you could say testosterone causes male genitalia to develop, but but really it's DHT, um, which is a product or a a related um, androgen hormone that that is converted from testosterone. So the lady cells make the testosterone. Some of that testosterone gets converted into DHT, and this this is how a male fetus develops. So the undifferentiated systems will differentiate into internal male genitalia and external male genitalia because of the hormones, right? The hormonal sex part of this, the hormones that are secreted 
after the testes develop. So you can see this is obviously a complicated multi-step process that leads to the regression of any female reproductive tract and leads to the, the development of the male reproductive tract. All right, let's get to females now. I know what you're thinking, you're like, females, whew, that's going to be tough. Not really. <laughs> Not really. We're essentially default female. I'm sure I've mentioned that in this class before. So for humans and other, <coughs> other mammals, we don't have a special gene that's involved in making the female ovaries. So essentially, around that seven or eight week period of development, the indifferent gonads, if they are not exposed to TDF, if there's no testes determining factor because there's no SRY gene, then those gonads develop into ovaries. It's kind of like automatic. It just, there's other genes that are sort of just, you know, helping with development generally, generally leading to development. And they just like automatically would make ovaries if there's no TDF. So if there's no testes determining factor because there's no SRY gene, then the gonads develop into ovaries. Like I said, that's not, that's not too bad. The ovaries, um, are full of, again, that, that endocrine tissue. So it's very similar to the tissues that make up the testes, but instead of developing into Sertoli or Leydig cells, because they don't have that testes determining factor, the tissues that are in the ovaries develop into uh, follicle and theca cells, which eventually develop into eggs and also have the ability to make um, hormones just like the cells in the testes do because they're endocrine tissues. So these endocrine tissues can secrete other hormones. Um, I know you're probably thinking estrogen, progesterone. You're correct. Um, technically also, we could get some androgens too. Um, but these cells are, are not going to actually produce anything that leads to the development of the external or internal female genitalia. It's just the lack of Mullerian inhibiting form uh, factor and the lack of testosterone and DHT that leads to the development of female, right? So there's no Mullerian inhibiting factor, which means the Mullerian system develops into the female reproductive tract. The Wolfian system does not develop into any sort of male reproductive tract because there's no testosterone. The external genitalia does not develop into male genitalia because there's no DHT, because there's no testosterone. So there's no testosterone. We don't get any of the male structures. Instead, we see the development of internal and external female structures. Like I said, for females, it's, it's almost a bit easier because it's just sort of automatic. It just happens. Um, obviously, like I said, there are um, many different factors that are involved in this, but when we're specifically focused on differentiation, the difference between males and females, it really comes back to the presence of the SRY gene that produces TDF, which leads to this whole pathway of development. If you don't have the SRY gene, you don't make TDF, then you go on this pathway to make female reproductive organs. Now, just to focus very briefly on the internal and external um, reproductive structures, um, I want to remind you that early on, both internal duct systems develop. So early on, again, this is our urogenital system, right? Here's our blad, what will be our bladder. Here's what would develop into kidneys, the ureters. And we have both the Mullerian duct system shown in the pink and the Wolfian duct system shown in the blue 
And then we have our undifferentiated gonads, which de depending on if the SRY gene is there or not, will either develop into the testes or the ovaries. So by default, without the SRY gene, we will see that these gonads develop into ovaries. So those tissues develop into the follicle cells and the theca cells. And the Mullerian duct system develops into the oviducts, or maybe you call those fallopian tubes, and the uterus and the opening of the vagina. In males, that MIF, Mullerian inhibiting factor, will cause the Mullerian system to degrade the testes with the secretion of their testosterone, right, will lead to the um, development of the Wolfian duct into the vas deferens, right, which we know will go and eventually connect to the urethra here. Because in males, of course, the urethra is the opening for both the urinary system and the reproductive system. Just to remind you, I'm sure you know, in females it's different. In females, the urinary system, the excretory system, um, has the urethra as the opening, but the female reproductive tract opens um, externally at the vagina. So we see that difference developing at this time too, um, which leads us to looking at the differentiation of the external genitalia. And so here, looking at sort of a, a color-coded view of what's happening externally, again, this is happening all very early on in the development in a few, you know, seven, eight weeks time. Um, we see that originally there's this undifferentiated external genitalia. This is really what we're looking at in humans, other mammals. Um, different tissues are essentially on one path or another. Um, so we have our genital turbicle here, um, our genital fold and the genital swelling. If DHT is present, remember if our dihydrotestosterone is produced from that enzyme that switches testosterone into DHT, which is only happening in the uh, individuals that have the SRY gene that are making testosterone, if that happens, if this is produced, then we start to see the development into, you know, the penis, the shaft, the scrotum, um, really the, the full development of that external genitalia, all due to the presence of DHT. Females, there is not a special different hormone that leads to the development of the female external genitalia. It's just the lack of DHT, so, so no DHT. If there's no DHT, these undifferentiated um, anatomical regions just develop slightly differently. What would have developed into the scrotal sac is now really the, the external labia, right? Our labia major. What would have developed into the structures that eventually become the, the tip of the penis develops into the clitoris. And what would have developed into our sort of shaft of the penis is now the labia minus, right? Or the minor, we call it, the labia minor. So we see that these are equivalent structures. They're structures that start to develop early on before differentiation. But then based on the presence of this hormone, which is going to be only produced in the presence of SRY, if there is that hormone, then external genitalia develops as male. If there isn't that hormone, then external genitalia will develop as female. It's not too complicated, right? Um, well, it does get a little more complicated. But uh, I just want to mention this. For now, so in addition to just the 
um, structures that we're familiar with, the internal and the external genitalia, right, the internal duct system, uh, the testes and the ovaries. In addition to that, the circulating hormones also are going to have some influences on the brain structures. And this has been pretty well studied in um, mice, but especially in birds. We've really, we've really learned a lot from studying the differences between um, how male bird and male and female bird brains are organized. So briefly looking at this graph here, this is, this is from a paper on, um, on mice. So, so the, the days, that's why I mentioned the days are a little bit different. Um, because they have a shorter gestation period than we do, of course, and they reach puberty after about a month, not, not you know, 12 years. So, so timing-wise, it's a little different. But the same basic mechanisms would be in place for any mammals we're looking at. Um, we know that during development and at birth that males have these high levels of testosterone. Females do not. So females do not have that same production of testosterone or other um, sex hormones. And we know that this actually has a serious effect on how the different areas of the brain develop. So we call these organizational hormonal effects. So how the brain itself actually is organized, developing. Long term, when we see the animals in puberty, there are going to be differences in their behavior because of what we call activational sex differences. So differences in how they react to hormones and how they react to external uh, stimuli because of the way in which their brains were originally organized based on the production of these different sex hormones. And so that's why one of the reasons why, that's one of the reasons why we will see differences in um, sexual behavior later, right? When, when it actually comes to the time where they've reached puberty and are going through sexual reproduction. And so we'll talk a little bit about this more um, in the future, but I did want to point out that even early on, there are going to be sex differences set up within our HPG system, our HPG axis, but also within other areas of the brain that lead to differences in um, behavior by the sexes later in life. So that's, that's what we have to look forward to talking about for the rest of the semester. But focusing back just on um, sexual differentiation, like I said, today's lecture was really focused on mammals since we do know so much about the SRY gene in humans um, and studied in mice and other rodents. But there are equivalents for those genes in many, many, many species who are using this sort of sex chromo chromosome or, or genetic determination system. And so this is just a short list of some animals besides mammals that have what we would call a master sex determining gene. So you see that for mammals, SRY is listed here. And for this example of a bird, a chicken, they have an equivalent ma master sex determining gene, which they call DMRT1. Um, but you can see again in some amphibians, fish, other birds, more fish, um, more fish, some insects. We have specific genes that we have identified <clears throat> that essentially start a system that's very similar to the one that I described today, which will lead to the differentiation into, you know, the, the organs that can produce sperm or the organs that eventually produce eggs. Even if we look at those species who aren't using genetic sex determination. So, for example, those that use sex determination based on temperature, like the different reptiles we talked about. 
We're still learning more about them, but we think that temperature does have this feminizing and masculinizing effect that is very similar to the production of the hormones that we talked about, to the gonadal differentiation, so is it going to be an ovary or testes, and even differences within the brain that eventually lead to differences in sexual behavior later in life. Um, but instead of a, an SRY gene controlling for this, there seems to be sort of activational effects based on the temperature. So a really interesting area of research that is still ongoing. We're still trying to figure out more about this. Um, I should also mention our sequential hermaphrodites that we talked about. So we mentioned those fish that are like male and then they turn female, like clownfish, or the fish that are female and then they turn male, like the, the guppies and, or the gobies and the, um, the wrasse. So they have sort of an interesting system too, because remember, they're like one sex and then the other. And so what we're finding out is that, um, you know, they start to develop as sort of the first sex. So in this example, we're looking at a fish that would be female first, we'll say, because the pink is sort of overrepresented in the gonad. But there's still tissue there that would be like the Sertolian Leydig cells, right? So they'd be testicular tissue, even though the majority of the gonad is going to be female. Um, so sometimes this is separated like, you know, top and bottom, and sometimes it's more of a mosaic where we have, you know, mostly female tissue and then male tissue sort of spattered throughout. And then when the environmental, social, whatever cue it is that that specific species needs for the sex change to start happening, um, when that cue starts the sex change, we start to see that the male tissue in this example starts to um, expand or overdevelop. And the, the female tissue in this example um, degrades until we have just the um, male specific cells that will now be able to produce sperm um, or vice versa would happen um, depending on the species. So again, what we see here at the end is that even if the mechanism of sex determination is different, if it's genetic or environmental, if you are one sex from the onset or you switch at some point in life, whatever the mechanism of determination is, the pathway to differentiation um, is very similar across all of these different species of sexual reproductive animals. So with that, what should I be working on? Um, if you haven't yet, this week our knowledge celebration is quiz number three. That's posted up on D2L. Um, it's only 12 questions. It should take you less than 30 minutes. So uh, hop on if you haven't done that yet. Next week, we are looking forward to our Knowledge Ce Celebration Exam 2. So all the topics that we've covered since the first exam uh, will be part of that, that exam, which is very similar to last time. Um, multiple choice questions, true, false questions, all within D2L. That'll be given next week on uh, October 26th. Um, in class this week in our live session, if you're going to join me Wednesday in person in the classroom or if you're going to join me live on Zoom on Friday, we are just going to review any questions that you have about differentiation or sex determination or Tim Bergen's Four Reasons Why Sexual Reproduction Happens. So sort of review the material, answer any questions, and talk about um, exam two. So make sure you bring your questions and are ready to discuss all that we've talked about. And as always, if you ever need anything, uh, you can always reach me via email at any time. All right, have a great week eight, everyone.